Great. So we're recording. And so I'll start with a brief intro to our guest speaker for today, Dr. Tracy Osborne. Um, so thanks so much. We're really lucky to have Tracy joining us for a guest talk today. Um, Tracy is actually a good friend of Kamal's who started grad school with Kamal around the same time at the UC Berkeley Energy and Resources Group. And um, her research focuses on the intersections of political ecology, climate change mitigation in tropical forests, global environmental governance, indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge, common property resource management, climate justice, and nature-based solutions to climate change. And Tracy's done some fascinating and important research on forest management, and um, especially, especially in Mexico and the Amazon, Ecuador, Peru, and Guyana, and has done some really cool mapping work. Um, she, her research is shared um, on, on her website at UC Merced, where she currently holds a position of assistant professor and she was previously at University of Arizona. Um, and I, I believe now you're the director of the UC Center for Climate Justice, which is a, a new entity in the UC system, which is, um, has a lot of really exciting things going on. So Tracy's also going to be helping us um, pull together a climate justice focused two day workshop um, that we're gonna host alongside the UC Center for Climate Justice um, and Tara in February, hopefully. <laughs> so it's just been really exciting to um, bring Tracy on board with various collaboration opportunities and learn from her. And um, she just brings a lot of expertise and enthusiasm to the climate mitigation um, and climate justice conversations. So thanks for being with us, Tracy, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lainey. And it's an absolute pleasure to meet all of you. Um, I've been hearing um, more about the, the climate course that you're participating in and um, really hope to add to some of those, those that discussions, particularly around um, climate change mitigation and tropical forest. So let me jump right in. Let me, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so um, let, me, let me jump right in and I'm gonna just ask you to hold questions until the end, uh, unless there's uh, you know, sort of a, a burning sort of clarifying question, but, but really would love to be able to get through this. It's a relatively short, shorter presentation and, and I really wanna make sure that we've got enough time for a discussion. Okay, so before I, I begin my talk, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the Yukut and Miwok indigenous peoples who first inhabited the land where UC Merced is located. Um, although I'm currently in Oakland, California, which is the ancestral, ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people who I also wanna acknowledge today. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about indigenous led climate change mitigation in, in the tropical forests of Latin America, mainly in Mexico, as well as the, the Ecuadorian Amazon. And so while it's argued in theory that forest-based carbon offset projects can represent a low cost strategy for managing climate change with multiple social and ecological benefits, in practice, they often fail on their own terms and can produce a host of problematic social and ecological outcomes. So this is something that you've, the, the global carbon budget is probably, it might be something that you've already covered in, in the course, but essentially the carbon budget is the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit before hitting certain um, critical um, uh, temperatures identified in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is a, a the carbon budget for, um, uh, identifying two degrees Celsius as as the sort of the, um, the the for the carbon budget, and this is estimated to be about 300, 3,000 billion tons since the, the since the industrial Revo revolution. And based on the two years, uh, oh, sorry, based on the two degree um, target, we're looking at seven seventeen years if we continue business as usual. We will use up the entire carbon budget. However, the Paris Agreement, um, as, as well as the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees, 
mentions and, and discusses the importance of keeping global temperatures um, certainly beyond uh, uh, below two degrees, but with an aim to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so this is a, a, a short um, kind of video that uh, kind of shows the, the ways in which how close, how quickly we're actually re we're going to reach the carbon budget of 1.5 degrees as well as two degrees. So two degrees is at 12 o'clock, 1.5 degrees, on this is is about um, about ten o'clock, and so we're going to be starting around the industrial revolution, and so you'll see here that we, as we start this this video, we see the image. It's in mid eighteen hundreds, the nineteen hundreds, and nineteen fifty. And at 1950, you're going to see a significant increase in the speed at which we're reaching, uh, carbon emissions are, are increasing toward the, the carbon budget. And so we see, and based on the IPCC report, we have 10 years, we will reach you know, the um, 1.5 degrees by the year 2030 if we continue business as usual. And so that 1950, where you see the carbon budget, where you see emissions increasing, is the time is is the develop the, the beginning of the development project it's it's the moment when the industrialized model of development gets picked up but also you know sort of foisted upon in, in many ways the developing world and so it's 1950s that's a really key date we see that this model the same model of, of industrial development based on fossil fuels is picked up um, and, and uh, encouraged to, to be also pick, picked up in the developing world. So the good news, and there's a lot of bad news, but the good news is that, um, and according to the IPCC report, is that there are strategies to stabilize the global temperature at 1.5 degrees. These do exist and they include a massive investment in renewable energy, keeping fossil fuels underground, particularly coal, as well as protecting and increasing forests. So we know that tropical forests represent an important arena for climate action. They are a significant source of carbon emissions when destroyed and or degraded, and they're also important sinks that contain approximately 650 billion tons of carbon. It's estimated that globally, deforestation and forest degradation account for approximately 11% 11, 11 of CO2 emissions. And in fact, if tropical forests were a country, it would rank third after China and the US. In many regions, the main drivers of tropical deforestation are what are called forest risk commodities. And in the Amazon, these commodities are the large scale production of soy, palm oil, beef, timber, and minerals. Roads and infrastructure associated with mining and oil and gas development can also open up forests to even further deforestation. Forests are particularly important climate change, are a particularly important climate change mitigation strategy because Unlike most solutions that prevent future emissions alone, forests also draw down atmospheric carbon. So avoided deforestation prevents future emissions while tree planting, reforestation, and restoration draw down emissions already in the atmosphere. Therefore, forests are an extremely effective means to capture and store carbon. The main strategy for mitigating climate change in tropical forests is what's called RED, which stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. And it includes conservation, sustainable forest management, and the enhancement of carbon stocks. That's the plus. RED is modeled on both payments for ecosystem services programs, as well as carbon forestry projects, which have been piloted since the 1990s. RED is based on market logic and arguments of cost efficiency, and it's also RED is also catalyzing a growing carbon industry. Since 2008, finance for RED has exceeded $20 billion and is likely to increase with greater attention to nature-based solutions in the context of initiatives such as the Bond Challenge, which aims to restore 350 million hectares globally by the year 2030. 
Approximately 90% of climate finance is public funding from countries such as Norway, Germany, the UK, Japan, and the US. And the carbon market activity is, the carbon market activity is mostly in the voluntary space since compliance carbon markets have limited or only cautiously included tropical forests into, pro into programs due to environmental integrity issues that I'll talk about, but also local resistance and other challenges of impl implementing projects on the ground. RED is based on the assumption that forests offer a low cost strategy for climate change mitigation. Nicholas Stern, author of the Stern Review wrote, and I quote, curbing deforestation is a highly cost-effective way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, end quote. This is largely based on tropical forest location in developing countries with often relatively lower cost of land and labor. And this assumption stems from a history of colonization and uneven development in many countries of the global south. In theory, Red Plus is pitched as a win-win solution to climate change that can reduce emissions at the lowest cost and generate other social and ecological co-benefits. Social co-benefits include sustainable development at the scale of local communities, as well as the country governments. Um, and ecological co-benefits include the maintenance of other ecosystem services, such as regulating water, <clears throat> regulating water and conserving biodiversity. However, in practice, RED has been challenging to implement and controversial among many local and indigenous peoples. Despite the low cost assumption, RED is costly to implement. Forest monitoring and carbon measurement reporting and third party verification are actually quite expensive, raising the overall project costs. In many cases, the lion's share of financial benefits for these projects goes to third party to it goes to third parties and government intermediaries as opposed to the communities themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, the majority of funding for projects is sourced from public entities, um, from governments, multinational institutions, et cetera. However, much of this funding is for red readiness and aims to prepare projects for results-based payments such as carbon markets. An important point here is that the prices associated with carbon markets are low and dictated by supply and demand. Therefore, participants can't easily influence or negotiate the carbon price or payments associated with these projects. Due to the market orientation, there's a near exclusive focus on carbon. Projects are managed for carbon over other social and ecological values. And when you manage for one area of value like carbon, you can often manage against other areas such as biodiversity and cultural or subsistence uses. And this can reduce the biocultural biodiversity, the biocultural diversity for forest ecosystems. Um, also, red projects have been, have been have failed, often in many cases have failed to address the real drivers of deforestation. The current price of carbon on the carbon market is low and therefore does not avert the real drivers of climate change. The low carbon price is insufficient to compete with the financially lucrative activities of soy, palm oil, beef, and timber. Therefore, projects tend to target indigenous and local, local land uses. And in doing so, these projects first blame local and indigenous peoples for deforestation, then enroll them as participants. Local communities must either restrict their land uses and or plant trees, such as fast growing or timber species, in order to receive carbon payments. And these payments are often insufficient to fairly compensate them for restrictive land use. The irony is that these carbon projects alter the same indigenous practice that have been critical for keeping forests intact. Um, we also know that indigenous and land use communities are incorporated into projects as participants, not as directors or equal collaborators in climate change mitigation projects. In many cases, some are involved in forest monitoring, but rarely take leadership roles in the projects. In general, community participants tend to receive relatively little financial or other benefit from carbon projects, while indigenous sovereignty and control over land management can be compromised. And finally, it's important to note that the framework guiding the development of Red Plus projects is based on Western knowledge with 
little if any attention to local ecological knowledge, even though indigenous knowledge has been central to forest prote protection over millennia. Furthermore, conventional projects often ignore indigenous perspectives of forest management and development and can alter traditional land use practices toward those with economic values such as timber plantations. The focus on economic value is often necessary to make projects financially viable and attractive to participants. Red also suffers from what is known as environmental integrity issues of permanence, leakage, and additionality, as well as what's called biotic versus fossil fuel carbon contradictions. The additionality criteria must demonstrate the carbon benefit is additional and would not have happened without the project. Leakage must demonstrate the carbon benefit in one area will not be released elsewhere. And permanence must demonstrate carbon will be stored over the long term. These environmental integrity issues are often violated. With regards to the forest carbon offsets, um, but, sorry, sorry. With, with regards to car forest carbon offsets, there are concerns about the conflation of biotic versus fossil fuel carbon, which are different pools of carbon, but within a carbon market are made equivalent to facilitate exchange. This conflation is particularly pro problematic when considering permanence. Fossil fuels that remain underground will not contribute to carbon emissions, but carbon stored in vegetation is in an active carbon cycle and in constant risk of being released due to fire, disease, or land use changes. Widespread fires in the Amazon and policy changes under the Bolsonaro administration in Brazil bring these issues into sharp relief. Many of these contradictions of carbon markets and tropical forests were evident in my earlier research in Chiapas, Mexico. Payments for ecosystem services and carbon forestry, like the Scolel uh, carbon project in Chiapas are considered precursors to Red Plus. The goal of Scolote was to reduce carbon emissions and deliver local sustainable development benefits. It began in the Chiapas Highlands in, the, in 1995 and moved to tropical forests in the lowlands to support small farmers impacted by NAFTA. The carbon payments pegged to carbon market prices were low and therefore there was an emphasis on planting high value timber species, species with the promise of future timber benefits to incentivize participation. I conducted this research in the indigenous community of Frontera Corosal, which is a Mayan Chol community on the Usumacinta River just across the border from Guatemala. Due to the low prices offered on the carbon market, most small farmer carbon producers planted high value timber species mostly in monoculture plantations in the spaces previously dedicated to managed fallows between the planting of subsistence crops. In many cases, these trees were attacked by a moth larva that stunted tree growth, reducing the value of the timber. Fire also destroyed planted trees. In 1998, fire destroyed large portions of the Lacandon jungle, exacerbated by deforestation and drier microclimates. Furthermore, smallholder carbon producers faced uncertain financial benefits from timber. This was the result of long growth cycles to harvest mahogany and tropical cedar. Also, timber harvesting for exchange violated indigenous and common property forest governance but that prohibited the cutting of trees for commercial uses. And based on the results of a carbon analysis, we found that the indigenous managed fallows had the potential to store and sequester up to three times more carbon than the carbon project that displaced indigenous land use practices. So this shows the importance of indigenous knowledge and governance for climate change mitigation. It also reveals a real disconnect between the value of indigenous forest stewardship and the carbon market on biophysical terms alone. A major contradiction of market based carbon forestry and red is the way they can alter indigenous land use and the very same practices responsible for forest stewardship in tropical forests like the Amazon. And this is not a romantic view. So I'm not saying that all indigenous communities in the world are managing land in sustainable ways or have done so historically. Nevertheless, there's a growing body of scientific evidence also recognized in the new IPCC special report on climate change and land that shows the importance of formally recognizing and securing local community and indigenous people's land tenure 
for climate change mitigation. When indigenous peoples have recognized land tenure, they are more effective at protecting their land and deforestation rates are three to four times lower than similar land under state or private control. This means that land under indigenous and local community management store more carbon. These communities account for approximately 300 billion metric tons of carbon in trees and soil. And this is about 33 times the energy emissions from the year 2017. However, many indigenous peoples in places like the Amazon are not only protecting above ground carbon, um, above ground and soil carbon, but they're also protecting forests from destructive activities like oil development, keeping fossil fuels underground. The, and they're doing this often at great peril. According to the Global Witness Report, 164 environmental defenders were killed in the year 2018, approximately three per week. Mining and agribusiness industries were largely associated with these deaths. In the Amazon, indigenous peoples are resisting oil development, helping to keep fossil fuels underground. There's a long history of oil development in Ecuador, and since and, and since the 1970s, Ecuador has been a major oil exporter. However, according to the Ecuadorian scholar Carlos Larea, after decades of oil development, mostly by international oil companies, including Chevron and Chevron and Shell, oil has contributed little to sustainable development, providing marginal, if any economic improvement, employment, or poverty alleviation. The legacy of oil development has also resulted in severe ecological damage and impacts on indigenous health and livelihoods, producing waves of indigenous and local resistance. While indigenous peoples have collective land rights guaranteed in the Ecuadorian constitution, the state maintains all subsurface rights through which it exploits oil even on indigenous lands. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples requires free, requires free prior and informed consent for extractive activities on indigenous lands, but it often, it's often violated by the state claiming the importance of oil to national development interests. The government has continued to lease oil blocks in the Ecuadorian Amazon, even in highly biodiverse areas such as the Yasuni National Park, often without free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. So while indigenous peoples of the Amazon protect forests and, pre and, and prevent carbon emissions, they receive less than 2% of red funding. Meanwhile, governments receive the lion's share of, of climate funding, which due to conflicting state policies produce contradictory results. For example, a prominent climate change mitigation program in Ecuador called Pro Amazonia has a budget of $60 million for five years, while Ban, Ban Ecuador the Development Bank of Ecuador has a budget of $1 billion, um, which is an, for the annual promotion of agriculture and livestock in the country. Also, Ecuador's development is based largely on oil extraction, particularly in the Amazon region, that we can see through the country's exports and loan repayments are based largely in, in oil. So on this, you can see this, this um, figure, this graph to the left, Ecuador's crude oil exports by, by destination in the year 2016. You can see that much of the, that, that oil actually goes to, um, to the United States, but also you can see a, a number of other countries in, in South America um, and a growing amount of that oil is, is actually being exported to, to China. Um, we also see that on this uh, graph on the right that China is increasingly lending to Latin American countries. And in the case of Ecuador, that loan repayment is, um, is th that loan is being repaid in barrels of oil. So the Ecuadorian Amazon contains approximately 90% of the country's oil blocks, and it's considered to have the largest reserves compared to the oil found on the coast. So in, in this graph, and based on sort of where much of the, the, the oil to, to China is going, that much, much of that oil is, is coming from the Ecuadorian Amazon. So this is um, uh, some maps that we've created as part of the Climate Alliance Mapping Project, um, a, a, a project of academics, environmental organizations, and indigenous groups that work in the area of climate justice. And so this is a map that shows fossil fuel reserves in the Amazon. And you can see that the, the fossil fuel, fuel reserves are, are really 
it's preserved throughout much of the Amazon, but we can see much of the development, both the proposed and the existing development, is taking place on the western in the western Amazon. So this is the, the countries of, of Colombia, of um, Ecuador, and Peru, and as well as Bolivia. Um, but we can see that you know we're seeing oil development in, in highly biodiverse places such as the Yasuni National Park, and this is one of the most biodiverse areas in the, in the world. So this is another map we created of indigenous territories and conservation areas across the, the Amazon. And so you can see that really much of the Amazon is a matrix of indigenous lands and conservation areas. So this makes much of the, the Amazon really a priority area for, for and a priority zone for keeping fossil fuels underground. And here you're gonna see an overlay of fossil fuel development with uh, indigenous lands and, and conservation areas. So really you, you can see that that, that you know, given the high biodiversity of this region, it it's, it's really makes no sense. And also just given the shrinking carbon budget, really makes no sense to be drilling in, in this, this region. So therefore, um, we're working with, beginning to work with indigenous peoples in the Ecuadorian Amazon um, to think about models for climate change mitigation that are based on indigenous knowledge, forest governance and land use practices. And this is really important given the important role that indigenous peoples play in protecting uh, forests and also keeping, keeping fossil fuels underground, but also protecting um, the biotic carbon, carbon in trees and, and in soils. But we also know that indigenous led practices can also avoid deforestation associated with forest risk commodities. And it, it, we also know, and, and that any, uh, any um, sort of project or program that involves indigenous peoples should be based on contracts and agreements as opposed to carbon markets, given some of the, the issues and concerns of carbon markets that I've discussed. We also wanna make sure that indigenous peoples are in leadership roles and that they're participating in all aspects of the projects including the monitoring of forests and measure, measurements of carbon biodiversity, as well as other indicators of ecological health. So this is some of the, the work that we're doing as part of the Center for Climate Justice that Lainey mentioned. And the, the aim or the, the mission of the center is to leverage and harness the power of the university to address the climate crisis from a systems and social justice perspective. The center will provide transformative education, conduct innovative broader impact research and engage the public in, in the support of environmentally sustainable and socially just forms of climate action. Thinking about you know, indigenous led practices is, is some, of, some of the work that we're, we'll be doing and that, that we'll, we're, we're doing as part of this, this new center. As you can see, we've got four key pillars. One is just transition, indigenous climate action, natural climate solutions such as, such as RED, but, but thinking about RED in, in with, with from more from an equity perspective, as well as climate education, communication and engagement. And so just wanted to, to re reiterate that I think some of the, the programs and projects that we hope to um, you know, engage indigenous peoples in are really um, kind of a mix of, of many of these, these pillars. So I'm going to end there and definitely would love to hear from you if you've got any questions um, or uh, yeah, clarifying questions or questions just more broadly. So I'll stop sharing now. Awesome. Sounds great. And I'll moderate some of the questions coming in from the chat. And I also have a few of my own if no one wants to start first. But um, Priya, was that a question that you were indicating or was that a plus one like agreement to something that Tracy was saying? Uh, that was an agreement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you if you have a question, feel free to like just note your name in the chat or type your question um, as usual. And um, yeah, maybe I will just ask one of mine first because I was I was jotting some down as you were speaking. Um, so one of them was about uh, you mentioned the like propensity to maybe over focus on carbon in a program like Red Plus or carbon markets in general. Um, that could potentially hinder other important functionality beyond carbon cycling or carbon management. 
So is this something that we really have to worry about with any carbon pricing scheme, which I think is often talked about as like a major potential solution to mitigating climate change? Um, and if so, like how, like in a, in a thinking about the forest context, but also other contexts, how might an overly narrow focus on carbon actually lead to some unintended consequences if we in carbon pricing policy proposals? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a that's a really important question. I mean, it, it plays a much greater role in forests because mm -hmm. it's you know I mean it, it, you have the the carbon offsets are either kind of more technology focused or they're land based. So mm -hmm. I should say that the land based projects you're going to have more of these types of issues because you know there are many values associated with land. Land have they have like cultural importance, particularly for indigenous peoples, for but for local communities, they have importance in terms of biodiversity. They have importance in terms of sort of um, water quality. They have religious and and spiritual in, importance as well. So you're not going to have that same issue with regards to technology. Mm -hmm. I think there are also some issues in terms of, uh, you know, um, sort of thinking about you know, the, the various um, greenhouse gases and, and, and having those all sort of um, uh, um, sort of estimated based on their, their carbon content. I think that that can create some, some other issues because methane is not the same as, as carbon. But I think that these types of issues of what are the values of land that might be outside of carbon, that might be mm -hmm. beyond carbon, because when when you're when you have a price on carbon and when you have a value an economic value, it will train the um, land use toward the whatever land use that is that has the greatest value. Which is also why you see that the carbon market has not been working to actually address the main drivers because mm -hmm. the value the main value economic value of that land tends to be cattle ranching or so large scale soy production. So mm -hmm. those those will outweigh even the carbon, but mm -hmm. so so again, this is why indigenous peoples and local communities are often involved in these projects because there's no way in within the current market mar, market carbon market structure that any of those that any of those activities will be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, but indigenous peoples and local communities have. A, a whole range of, of value that they give to those to, to that land and because of their the 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 sort of the larger political economic political economics um their their land use is now being being displaced so right. um cool. yeah so when when you manage so it's not just the economic value but it's the focus right and mm -hmm. so when you're managing for one you can mm -hmm. oftentimes uh limit or work against or sort of manage against but things like mm -hmm. biodiversity. And we've seen this mm -hmm. time and time again. This is exactly yeah. why we're not seeing uh, a kind of a, you know, in, in, in this project in Mexico and actually in a lot of the reforestation projects, we're seeing that they, they look very similar to a type of monocultural system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard this come up in, um, in like so soil-based carbon sequestration on farms as well. Like, you know, if we were just focusing on carbon sequestration, we would not be growing food, perhaps we would be growing trees. And so if your goal is food production and carbon sequestration, and there's a payment for carbon, like it's just, yeah, it can be a tough proxy for a payment for ecosystem services and land that is, you know, more holistic than just carbon. So yeah, that's, I appreciate your further insights on, on that. Yeah, and, that's and it makes really, sense. yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a really great question. And, and I think it's, it, it also is linked to that mark to the market model. Right. I mean, so we we, we want to sort of think beyond the the market model because markets are oriented toward sort of, um, you know, commodities. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to be. There's such a thing as an embedded market. So I think there are ways of sort of thinking about markets in some new ways in, with it, within the system. But I think particularly when it comes to forests, the, mm -hmm. the market mechanism has been historically has been problematic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, thanks for elaborating on that. And I'm going to go to Aman Gupta. I see your hand raised and then we'll go over to Sarita's question in the chat. So go ahead, Aman. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tracy, for uh, 
uh, this talk. Uh, so I have a question uh, building on what you said that uh, usually market-based mechanism uh, don't factor in uh, these essential uh, aspects of indigenous uh, involvement or uh, indigenous land rights. So uh, despite that, that, that fact, uh, most of the countries are adapting one or the other form of market mechanism, specifically in Latin American countries, including Pacific Alliance countries. So, and uh, those countries, uh, for instance, they recognize nature-based climate solutions as one of the car carbon offset mechanism, uh, wherein uh, you did mention that uh, the indigenous participation is, you, is not getting mainstream. Uh, so while you mentioned that there's a need to have a more holistic system in place, uh, I just wanted to uh, understand or uh, have your thoughts on if there is there any country or any uh, market-based mechanism in place which is kind of recognizing these indigenous uh, uh, participation as part of by developing uh, such carbon offset projects. And if so, which are those uh, countries or uh, market-based mechanisms? And if not, uh, how, what, what's the possible roadmap? Because I, I feel that carbon market is the way forward, or at least this is getting popularity amongst countries uh, acro uh, across uh, continents. So how do you think that uh, indigenous uh, land rights and their participation can be integrated in the existing okay. carbon markets? So, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, so in terms of like, what are some, programs that are really thinking about indigenous peoples within the a, a kind of a climate change mitigation uh, uh, initiative or space. Um, there's one uh, that I know of in that's part of the Amazon. It's called COICA, which is a, a coordinating um, group of indigenous peoples of, for the entire Amazon basin. All nine countries of the Amazon is uh, there's a, a kind of a, a um, indigenous, indigenous leadership from all nine countries and it's a coordinating body called COICA. They have proposed a, an indigenous led uh, forest strategy, climate change mitigation strategy um, that is very much based on indigenous land use practices, indigenous forms of governance, recognizing the, the important role of, of indigenous peoples. They participate in these climate, um, meetings and and really are promoting uh pr promoting the, the this these, these types of strategies you know th these are nine countries these are you know hun hundreds of, of 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 indigenous um peoples and some of them have already been involved in carbon markets and they've been advocating for for you know for for rights and sort of pushing the market to sort of meet the, meet some of their needs there's an example in the United States, actually, of the Yurok indigenous peoples in California. They are participating in California's carbon market. I think that example is actually because you know what they're using the money for? So they've been part of the California's carbon market. This is These are Yurok people in, 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 in indigenous peoples of, of California. They are using the money to buy their land, buy back their land. So in some ways we might say that's kind of problematic. I mean, the United States was all indigenous land. They should just be given that land. We might say that, but you know, that's not a very easy, you know, we're, uh, that, we're, that's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to easily sort of negotiate that. But with the carbon money, part of the carbon market, they have bought back their land. And for a lot of those people, they, they find that to be, a lot of the, the, the community, they find that to be, that's, that's something that they've been, wanting for a very long period of time and the carbon market has made that possible. Are there problems even in California? Of course. But so but I think, you know, your point is that, you know, there are there have been markets. I mean, we've had markets since the beginning of like, you know, human civilization. We've had some form of exchange. So how do we think about what what might be called a, an embedded market? So Right now, what the problems with markets and the pro the problems that 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 in, in a lot of like neoliberal markets or free markets is that these markets tend to uh, we society society has to sort of meet the needs of the market. 
that the market is much larger and the society is sort of within this market and we have to we we are compelled to meet the needs of of the the market we are but what we really want is for society to be of that in that larger sphere and the market to be within and the market meets the needs of society that's what we're moving that's the type of market that we need in the climate space but great question thank you yeah thanks for that response Casey um, and Sarita I'm going to call on you if you um, if your internet is, is strong enough to ask both of your questions in whatever order you want it looks like your second one was somewhat along the lines of um, Aman's maybe question, the but, yeah. sec second question maybe uh, if uh, uh, Tracy can answer that as you said that most of the projects of red are funded by the public funds and how much uh, is there a scope for the indigenous community to have their say in the in the matter in the projects that are being done there yeah so indigenous peoples are certainly you know they they have they've they have have, have had access to very little of that of that funding is is the truth a lot of the funding um goes through the state um goes through to governments and there mm -hmm. are programs so for example in ecuador there's a program called socio bosque which involves indigenous peoples they are a, they do receive funding to protect uh you know to keep their their forest intact um it's very little funding uh, compared to sort of the type of the, the type of funding that would be really needed for them to really um, continue their they're they're going to continue their their land use practices, but there's also a lot more pressure on them to provide their consent to other forms of extractive sure, yeah, but, uh, you can elaborate. and and so. Um, so, you know, is there is there an ability for them to get some money? Are, are you saying from the from state entities? They do get some, right? I mean, they are involved because the the, the country governments recognize the important role of indigenous peoples. So they are getting some of that funding, but it's very little, and it's not where they have any type of leadership position or role. The, the, the other question that leads to is: Are they are they being displaced from their from their land or from their area? In, in some cases, there has been uh, uh, land dispossession. Um, there's been a number of studies that have talked about like sort of loss of like access to land or land dispossession due to these projects. In some cases, you know, it's a type of payments to change their land use practices, which in some ways is a, a, a kind, I mean, they, they lose access to the benefits of the land that are of greatest need, that might be of greatest need or a, 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 that are culturally um, important. So for example, like the, the, the example that I gave you in, in Mexico. So in some cases, there has been, there have been examples of, of land dispossession associated with this. Because back in, uh, in, in, in India, uh, it's not of that scale as in Amazon, but there are pockets in the Northeastern region in the central India part also where many indigenous tribes are there. And there are even in Maharashtra, there are primitive tribal groups uh, right. uh, staying. So they right. feel this pressure of, uh, of the, of the so-called development projects there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are NGOs who fight for them because they uh, themselves cannot raise their voice so mm -hmm. there are NGOs and there are activists who who sort of are on their side and they help them raise their voice. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of NGOs that are working closely and support indigenous peoples. But I have to say that in the Amazon, they are uh, 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 they are very powerful, very strong. Mm -hmm. They are very strong. So they have a very strong voice, but they also have a lot of allies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Casey, there was another related question from Ritika about um, how REDD Plus operates in the context of Southeast Asian countries, which I know might not be as directly where you've done your research, but um, if you could point to any resources, there also will be more, I'll just say as a disclaimer, in the class coming up that talks about Red Plus. There's like some examples from uh, a map where you can click on different parts of the world, but yeah, go ahead if there's anything else you want to add um, to address Ritika's yeah. question. Um, I mean, you know, there are, I mean, the, there are 
our projects across the, you know, uh, like uh, in, in all top of the forest, you know, I mean, there's like there's certainly been a number of, of sort of highly, um, uh, Indonesia, there've been a number of like really important projects in, um, in uh, certainly in, in Indonesia, in, in India, in, um, in the Philippines, there are a number of groups that have been working, Tebteba, a group that's been working on uh, with definitely some concerns around red, but also the role of indigenous peoples. So in on the, the, the east in, in, in Africa, I mean, really in all sort of tropical countries, there are groups and initiatives around um, around red. In, in Indonesia, I know there's been a number of efforts to focus on sort of peat um, mm -hmm. forests and also um, in, in uh, you know, also working with, with um, kind of local communities and, and indigenous peoples of those, those areas. I mean, it's not, a, yeah, again, it's not an area where I've, I've spent a lot of time, but, um, but I, I mean, I mainly, I'm, I'm mainly like sort of working in, in the Americas, but um, there are definitely some really uh, important efforts uh, around climate change mitigation and local communities and indigenous and indigenous peoples across, mm -hmm. you know, across, across the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great to hear. And we'll, we'll dig into this more, Ritika, so don't worry. Um, and I, I just have a related question as you're, as you're talking, and then I'll get to Alyssa and Nikhil's, sorry, I can't help myself, but um, related to this point of, you know, like payments for keeping forests in the ground, forests intact, and, and paying for carbon offsets once we've released fossil fuel reserves, are there any, like, it, and it seems obviously so much better to just leave the fossil reserves in the ground in the first place so that they don't add into the biospheric carbon cycling processes but are there any examples of like payments for keeping fossil fuels reserves in the ground rather than burning them and then paying to offset them? I mean, no. that seems like, yeah. Well, okay, so <laughs> no, but that's exactly what I think we, wh where, we, where we, we need to go. I mean, I would say the closest um, model to what you're talking about was the Yasuni ITT proposal of mm. also of Ecuador in, mm. in um, the mid, mid 2000, uh, 2007. Um, mm -hmm. So the Yasuni proposal was a proposal of the Ecuadorian government, but also with a lot of support uh, and, and participation of NGOs. And, the, and Rafael Correa, then, then, then president, asked the, you know, um, there were oil blocks in Yasuni National Park, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. With, and he basically sort of um, made a request to the international co um, community and said, look, I will, we will be able to, we will have the opportunity and be able to keep fossil fuels underground in Yasuni if we get the, if we get funding based on, if we get, uh, if, if you all donate um, money that's equal to half of the value of the oil underground. And that was like two point three point six billion dollars. They they would keep the Yasuni intact and not drill in the Yasuni National Park. They got like four percent of that. They got very little little from the international community. And so what happened in you know 2013? Um, they started sort of handing out leases and like drilling began in like 2000 2016. So now there's drilling in one of the most highly like biodiverse places in in the world um, because they didn't get that funding. But had that money been attached to a type of carbon market, mm -hmm. had they been able to, but, but you know, obviously then you'd have to sort of make sure that the price was more than the, 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 the price of the price of, of oil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like oh, it would have yeah. to be more than the price of oil per associated with carbon, you know, like equivalent to carbon. Mm -hmm. And, um, but essentially that, that is exactly what we need, but we don't, but instead, and this is the, the, an example, this is the reason why this biotic versus fossil fuel carbon is so problematic because we're saying that we can protect, we can grow trees in Mexico or in India or in the Philippines, we can just grow trees there. And that would be the equivalent to burning, you know, uh, fossil fuels in, in the UK or in California. Mm -hmm. Mm 
And yeah, it's, it those are very different pools of carbon. Yeah. Because carbon that's stored underground, if you don't drill it and burn it, it's never going to be released. But look what's happening in California with all of the mm-hmm. fires. They're mm-hmm. they're going up and like we can't we can't demonstrate we can't ensure permanence in 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 a warming world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it comes yeah, to I mean, and it's not the way that it's like like even set up to work ecologically. And so that that's the other thing that I feel like the carbon offsets and carbon market space is missing is some sort of ecological knowledge to th- to understand that like, oh yeah, this cycling carbon in the biosphere, like sure the trees burn, but then some of that carbon is returned to the ground in ash and like some of it's released to the atmosphere, but then more trees grow and that it's like, it's constantly cycling. So, but that's so the opposite of the case with these fossil fuel reserves. So it's, yeah, yeah. I just hope that we can work towards that somehow. Um, yeah. Okay, and I just want to, I'm going to ask Alyssa's question because she, I think, had to drop off a few minutes early. And then Nikhil, I'll bring you in to ask your follow up question. Um, so Alyssa wrote, re embedded markets. Do you think a global price on carbon would enable more effective forest markets so that the cost to produce extractive projects or risk commodities would become too expensive and unable to compete with sequestration projects? Um, and Nikhil, what was your follow up to that? Do you want to just? Tag it on sure. here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Professor Osmo. Um, so my question was: uh, Do you have just this may be outside your area of do you have a perspective on some effective ways that we can change behavior on the demand side for extractive pro- uh, products? Like I, I, uh, just also maybe like what percentage of uh, uh, on the supply side is really controlled by indigenous? Uh, communities, I, I feel like uh, um, a lot of it is probably uh, not, and so that, that that's a big problem, too. <laughs> Nikhil, it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't 100% clear, um, so, but I think what you were asking, I think I heard something about the, the question about the demand side, like what are some strategies on the demand side? That, that's right, right, yeah. Like for yeah. palm oil and other, yeah, uh, soy, soybean and yeah. so on. But, yeah. Well, you know, there are proposals um, and policies that some companies have been picking up, but actually also some countries and, and uh, other jurisdictions have been interested in and, and also, you know, considering, which are these um, procurement policies, these deforestation-free pr- procurement policies. So, um, you know, there, I know there was, there was a, um, some interest in, 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 in a, pro, a deforestation free procurement policy in California, but I think that those uh, really reduce um, the, the consumption, can really reduce the consumption of these commodities that lead to deforestation. I mean, it obviously will require a, 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 like a, pretty massive sort of research research to sort of identify, not massive, but like some research to identify where these products were coming from. But there are a number of uh, jurisdictions and companies that are measuring and really being careful and, and avoiding uh, um, procurement or, or you know, consumption and purchasing of any commodities that are associated with deforestation. So I don't know. I, I I hope that that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, it did. I, I'll I'll research that uh, some more. Yeah, yeah. No, those I think those are really uh, um, can be really in, interesting and important. And then about the um the sort of the social cost for carbon. Mm. Um. Yeah, I mean, I do. Th- I mean, the social cost for carbon are are significantly higher than the current market price. So mm-hmm. of course, I think that would make, and, and, and a social cost that would be higher than the, um, the commodity, forest risk commodities, of course, but also we have to recognize that government, this is exactly why giving money to governments is within this context is not producing the results. If you, we think that we've been having uh, climate meetings you know, climate change annual meetings for like, since like for about 40 years. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been annual for 40 years, but for 40 years, we've been having um, international meetings around climate change. 
And emissions have only just come down in the year 2020 because of COVID. Not, and, and this is the first year we have not had an annual meeting for decades. So these meetings are not really producing anything. And who shows up at these meetings? It's governments. It's a lot of NGOs, it's certainly a lot of NGOs, but also increasingly industry has been participating in these meetings. But it's within the same political economic structure. And this is exactly why giving all of the money toward the state when they have these conflicting policies without a price that's going to really drive any type of difference, it's like throwing money away. It's not making any real, it's not having any real impact. It is not. And the, the science alone, the, the, that carbon budget, like figure illustration, that like tells you everything. That tells you everything that we need to know. Mm -hmm. So we need a new system and we do need a price on carbon, no doubt about it. Um, I prefer, I really like an, uh, the idea, uh, you know, I think we need multiple mechanisms, but I do think that a global carbon tax is really, an, it's easier to implement. It makes sense, you know, and, and also we're, what we're seeing is that it, it, it would, it would change, it, it, it makes sure that the incentives are moving in the right direction, it ch changes behavior. Um, but also what we're seeing is that there are still global subsidies for the things that we don't want. We are global subsidies for agriculture in the Amazon, for oil and, and fossil fuels. In the year 2017, global subsidies for fossil fuels was $5.2 trillion with a T, trillion dollars with a T in one year. And this is two years after the Paris Agreement. So this, the, we, we need a systems perspective to look at these issues. Um, we need it and we need an equity and a justice perspective and we need a historical perspective to see sort of like how we got into this position. How is it that this industrial model of development based on fossil fuels, both in our industrial development space, but also in, in our agricultural space, how that has led to the types of problems that we need. So we we're, we're really need a very different model for development and we can't go back we only can go forward, but there are certain lessons from the past that I think we can bring into the future to help us think about what sustainable, a, a, a just and sustainable future might look like. Totally. Yeah, and on your point about less meetings and more, you know, other, other things that aren't meetings, um, I feel like there's been a lot of, you know, maybe I've just been taking time to catch up over the past two weeks, but a lot of really creative storytelling, art, and like harnessing the power of culture to better communicate things like this carbon budget that might be obscure to a lot of people. Exactly. And so having like more voices that are communicating powerful and, um, you know, accessible stories and narratives around this exactly. feels like a real exactly. goal. <laughs> I 100% I agree because you know, who has been dominating the climate narrative has been climate scientists, natural science, natural and physical scientists and climate mm. models and climate scenarios. And while that's all important, there, and, but there, there was a lot of discussion early on about how much uncertainty there was in the models. Mm -hmm. We don't need to talk about the uncertainty in the models. We know that climate change is happening. So let's stop talking about the uncertainty in the models. People, the general public does not understand, like can't sort of capture. That's not the, that's not the essence of what we need to communicate. What we need mm -hmm. to communicate is that climate change is real. It's an urgent, extremely urgent and existential crisis that, that requires immediate action. I think there was also, especially because it was dominated by kind of the physical natural scientists, less of the attention to the political economic dimensions. The, mm -hmm. It was also dominated by economists, mm -hmm. right? Which that was mm -hmm. not thinking about the political economic and the power mm -hmm. imbalances and the historical inequities and, and the, the role of, of the history of development. They were not, those were not dominant in the, in those narratives. They were in the NGO space and the climate justice space in mm -hmm. some of the, in, in, in a, in a, in some of the, the academic space, but those were not the spaces that got a lot of the funding or the attention or the platform. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I agree with you. I think we need, need different narratives, different stories. Storytelling is powerful. We, and, and, and again, like I'm on, like I, you know, you're, you're right about like there, we, we do need markets. Of course, we live in a world where mar markets have existed. So, but how do we think, rethink these markets? And I don't think that necessarily markets need to dominate the climate change mitigation. I don't think they should dominate, 
I think they need to be a part, markets certainly need to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to think about all of the various market mechanisms, financial mechanisms that make sense because we, we can't ignore markets where we're, our world is dominated by markets. So how do we rethink those? How do we, how do we engage a range of other financial mechanisms? How do we share stories uh, in new, in different ways, in ways that people can really understand and can are compelling because um, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Do I, we don't have a lot of time, but honestly, I've been working on this stuff for a really long time. I have, I still have hope. I have a lot of hope. If I did it, I would just be like lying down. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd be still in my bed, <laughs> but I have a lot of hope. And I do think that um, we have, that we have a moment and we have an opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. COVID has been very challenging for the globe. It is also, it, it's, been, it's been devastating. It's been devastating. It's changed everything that we, we thought we, we knew about like what life could be like, and it's not over. It has also given us a moment where people for the first time are starting to think, they're starting to rethink like this whole model. Like, do I need to go to work every day? And like, you know, some of you are probably in places with, um, uh, with high levels of like air pollution that all of a sudden like the air is clean. You know, it like our water quality has significantly improved. Carbon emissions have come down for the first time. And we're still, you know, I mean, what, what, but, but what we see is that governments are, well, let's just talk about the US government um, has given significant amounts of money actually to, to not just companies, but a lot to fossil fuel companies. This is not the time to be propping up those companies. We need to, that money needs to go to renewable energy. We need to be subsidizing and supporting renewable energy and small businesses and individuals so that they can like have, they can live well and have like, you know, have like a, a be able to take care of themselves under, under such really devastating, challenging like situations. And there's been very little money that have gone to, gone to people. That money needed to go to people and small businesses and medium-sized businesses. And so that people can be safe not to, to fossil fuel. So there is a lot of money that, that's available that, is, that could be going in different directions. And so I think COVID has really sort of opened our eyes to, first of all, given us a moment to pause, like really question, like, is this the way we want to go? It, it, also, I think we want to really make, remember that COVID is also the result of this type of political economic system and mm -hmm. deforestation and degradation. It's because wildlife, it, we are now in much closer proximity to the wildlife that it, it, it is where, where these, these viruses come from. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are shrinking those habitats. We are, we are encroaching even more and more on that wildlife. That needs to stop. So we can see a climate COVID connection really clearly. And we really want to make sure that we protect that habitat we protect the wildlife and and the biodiversity um, because we, we it is all, we are all connected. We are we are part of this like this global ecosystem, and you know there is a, a kind of we're seeing like kind of a pushback, and we're seeing some um, we've 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 gone beyond certain limits that we're now starting to see the the impacts. But I think there's a moment right now of where there's greater awareness, public awareness, mm -hmm. and uh, where we've, how we got here. Mm -hmm. And it's giving us a moment to really think about where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, that's, we're all about that at Terra, starting with assignment one, where we talk about the links between COVID and climate and where we want to go by 2040. It's, yeah. yeah, it's important to do that visioning of what the world could be and not just where we're headed. Um, exactly. But yeah, thanks for wrapping that all up on such a holistic and um, in the moment note. And um, yeah, thanks so much for your time, for your talk and your answers to everyone's great questions. And um, yeah, I'll wrap things up just by saying thanks and I'll be sharing the chat and the recordings once they're available with everyone. So Thank thanks so all. Much. It was really great to meet all of you. Yeah, it was a great talk. <laughs>
Bye, everyone. Stop recording.